Welcome to the On Your Mind podcast, where we believe mental illness can be temporary and transformative. Stay tuned for innovative, effective tools from experts in the field of mental health. Hosted by Timothy J. Hayes, psychologist. This podcast aims to change the narrative around mental illness. Move from a place of fear to a place of hope and solutions. Here on On Your Mind. Dr. Nishi Bhopal is triple board certified in psychiatry, sleep medicine, and integrative holistic medicine. She graduated from the University College Cork School of Medicine, completed her psychiatric residency at Henry Ford Health System, and a fellowship in sleep medicine at Harvard Medical School. She also received training through the Maharishi Ayurveda Association of America and the Integrative Psychiatry Institute. Well, Dr. Bhopal, thank you so much for being here again. It's a delight to have you back. And uh, I'm anxious to hear um, about your sleep program and this specialty that you have within the uh, integrative psychiatry practice that you do. Well, thank you for having me back. It's a delight to be here. And yeah, I'm really excited to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is sleep. Well, tell us about this. um, Did you say it's a four-week program? Yes. So I have a four-week online holistic sleep optimization program, and it consists of four modules where I essentially walk people through the different elements of their day in order to optimize sleep at night, because improving and enhancing your sleep quality at night really does start during the day. I never would have thought of that. Do tell. How is that? Okay, so the way that this works is there are essentially three prongs that I like to focus on when looking at sleep quality and when working on enhancing your sleep. So these three things are the circadian rhythm, the sleep drive, also known as the homeostatic sleep drive, and then also your mindset and your nervous system. Now, if you can get those three things into alignment and getting those three things into alignment starts during the day, When those three things are lined up, then you'll be well on your way to achieving good quality sleep. So how do you assess things like the circadian rhythm? So I'll just explain a little bit about what the circadian rhythm is. And I find the circadian rhythm incredibly fascinating because it's essentially our connection to the planetary rhythms. Our circadian rhythm as humans is entrained to or aligned with the day-night cycle or the light dark cycle. And it's approximately 24 hours. The human circadian rhythm is actually slightly longer than 24 hours. But when you line it up with the natural day night cycle, it actually then uh, becomes a 24 hour rhythm. And the circadian rhythm, a lot of people know about this in relation to sleep. Um, It helps to regulate our sleep wake cycles, but it does much more than that. It also regulates our levels of alertness. It regulates hormone secretion, um, metabolism, when we get hungry, it also regulates our body temperature and so many other functions. So our brain has a little tiny clock in it, which is our master clock. And that's what's aligned to the day night cycle. But all the cells in our body and the organs in our bodies have their own little clocks in them that kind of keep things running on time. So it keeps our body running on a schedule. What happens if one of my little tiny clocks is off a a little bit from another one? Do I have a crisis internally? (laughs) Right. So it's not necessarily a crisis per se. Um, Now, okay, how do you know if you have a circadian rhythm misalignment or issue? I don't really like to call them circadian rhythm disorders. Um, In the DSM, we call them, you know, delayed sleep phase disorder and shift work disorder and so forth. Some of us are slightly on the delayed side. We might be a little bit more of a night owl. Some of us are more on the advanced side where you might be a bit more of a morning lark, as we call it. And these are just variations in the circadian rhythm. And there are actually clock genes that determine this. So there is a genetic basis to this. There's also a social basis to this. So your body clock is going to adapt somewhat to your uh, daily social obligations, your work schedule, school schedule, and so forth. 
There are ways, however, to tell if your circadian rhythm is misaligned. One way to tell that is uh, if you're having a lot of trouble falling asleep at night, but then it's uh, once you fall asleep, you stay asleep through the night and then it's hard to wake up the next morning. We see this a lot in adolescents and young adults. That could be a sign that you have what we call delayed sleep phase syndrome. So that's a delayed body clock. On the other hand, if it's hard to stay up at night and you're falling asleep around you know, 7, 8, or 9 p.m. and then you're waking up really early, like around 4 a.m. or sometimes even earlier, that could also be a sign that it's a circadian rhythm issue. Um, and that would indicate something called advanced sleep phase syndrome. And as I was saying, these are not necessarily disorders. They're simply variations in your body clock, but they become problematic when your body clock is misaligned with your social obligations. Yeah. So I have kids I have to attend and they're going to go to sleep at um, eight or nine and I want to fall asleep at seven. That's a social obligation that's going to create a problem. (laughs) With your work, have you discovered ways to help people shift whether they have an early or late alignment phase? How do you how do you address that? Well, as I mentioned, the circadian rhythm is aligned with the day night cycle or the light and dark cycle. So you can actually use that to your advantage when you're trying to shift your body clock. In my practice, I I see mostly people who are on the delayed side. I work with a lot of young adults in their 20s and 30s. So about 16% of adolescents have what we call delayed sleep phase syndrome, but that can carry over into adulthood. And I see a lot of these folks in my practice. And what we do is we really leverage the power of light to line up their body clock with their work schedule and their work demands. And how we do this is either by using natural light, bright natural light in the morning by going outside um, in a prescriptive way, or we'll use like a sunrise alarm or a light box. So there are devices that emit bright light that we can use to help to shift the circadian rhythm. On the other end, on the nighttime end of things, we really leverage the power of darkness. An environment of darkness helps to promote the body's natural production of melatonin. Sometimes I will use exogenous low dose melatonin to help pull the sleep a little bit earlier. So we use melatonin to pull the sleep earlier and then light to kind of shift that wake time earlier. Um, So it's a way to kind of shift that whole cycle. And we'll do this in a strategic way gradually over time. Because the mistake that I see a lot of people making is that if they're on the delayed side and they're naturally waking up, let's say at 9 or 10 a.m., and then they have to get up at 6 a.m. on a weekday for work, um, they will try to just kind of shift their schedule drastically or abruptly. And then what happens is like it's like pulling a, a rubber band. It just kind of snaps back in the opposite direction and it's hard to maintain. So I do it in a very gradual, prescriptive, strategic way so that it's sustainable. So you're working with a little melatonin to help them get asleep a little earlier and the brightness to help make sure they wake up in the morning, the darkness at night. These are things that I've been trained to talk about as the sleep hygiene, all of these different things related to preparing myself for sleep, the kind of environment I'm going to be in, the sound, the light, you know, what I'm gonna put in my body in preparation for sleep so I'm not gonna eat a great big meal and then lay down or, and I'm I'm assuming that in this four week program you have, there's all kinds of aspects, including that preparation for sleep at night. What do you do with somebody who's just, they can't get to sleep and it's 12, one, two at night? Yeah, that is such a common issue and Sleep hygiene is important. Setting up your schedule in the evening is incredibly important to kind of lay the foundation. But what we do know is that sleep hygiene alone does not work. It's not enough. And this is where people start to get frustrated because they feel like they've tried all the things, they've read all the articles online, they've done it and it hasn't worked. So this is where refocusing on those three prongs that I mentioned, so circadian rhythm, sleep drive, but then the mindset and reducing hyperarousal, the nervous system hyperarousal response is really important. So for that person who is going to bed and they just cannot fall asleep, what you wanna do is actually get out of bed and don't get back into the bed until you're really sleepy 
and tired. Because what happens is that when you're in your bed awake, frustrated, or tossing and turning, you're training your brain to do that when you're in the bed. So your brain starts to associate the bed with a place that you're awake and alert. So we wanna break that association by getting out of bed and only getting back into bed when you are sleepy. And how do you know when you're sleepy? It's when your eyes are heavy and your head is nodding. It's hard to stay awake. That is when you want to get into bed if you are someone who is having trouble with sleep. The second thing I would recommend for that person who's struggling to fall asleep is to stop focusing on trying to sleep. And I know this is easier said than done, but the more we try to sleep, the more elusive sleep becomes, the harder it is to fall asleep because you're reinforcing that hyper arousal response where you're getting anxious and frustrated. So what you wanna do is instead of trying to sleep, just shift your attention to relaxation. Do things that you find enjoyable. Maybe it's watching a television show that you like or reading a book that you enjoy. Nothing too stimulating, not the latest Stephen King novel or something that's gonna keep you up all night, but something that's relaxing. Maybe you do some yoga, have a warm shower, something like that. It doesn't actually necessarily matter exactly what the activity is, as long as it's not too stimulating, but shift your focus to something that's relaxing rather than focusing on trying to sleep. Yeah, that's been a big thing with a lot of people that it's like those people who decide they want to meditate and they've got this idea and they buy a program that tells them what to do to meditate and clear your thoughts and make sure no, no thoughts intrude. And then every time a thought intrudes, they just get furious and it, it's counterproductive. Well, the same kind of thing happens if people say, I've got to get to sleep. Oh my God, it's 1230. Oh my God, it's quarter to one. Oh my God, I'm never going to be able to get up for work in the morning. That cycle of obsessive thought, anxious inducing thought is itself the thing that'll keep most people from slipping into that lovely thing we call sleep. That's exactly right. And, you know, the people who sleep well, don't think about it, right? Like if you, if you sleep well, you don't really think about sleep. You're not going online researching it. You're not going on Facebook groups trying to figure out, you know, what's going to work for you and what isn't. When, you, when you're a good sleeper or someone who sleeps well, now I hesitate to use the term good sleeper or bad sleeper because there's really no such thing. Everyone's a good sleeper. We are all capable of sleeping. Our bodies want to sleep. It's a physiological process that we all do and we all can do well. But if you're someone who has trouble sleeping, what often happens is that you're thinking about it 24 seven and that actually feeds into the problem. So what do you suggest for people like that? Uh, by the way, I have several in my caseload right now, whether they're in their 40s or they're in their 70s. And um, as you know, because you specialize in this, when you're dealing with somebody who's having difficulty sleeping, they get to feel like this is panic inducing. Yes. And so we want to start to break that panic response, that hyper arousal response. And how we do that is there are several ways to kind of approach this. One is to start examining the thoughts that we're having about sleep. And so this is part of the you know, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia protocol or CBTI protocol. So really identifying, okay, what are the thoughts that you're having about sleep? And how are those thoughts serving you? How true are those thoughts? And how can we reframe them? For example, many people believe that we have to get eight hours of solid sleep every night. And if you're not getting that, then you're a bad sleeper. And that's simply not the case. Sleep varies from night to night. It's normal to have some good nights, some bad nights, some nights where you get a little bit more, you, sometimes you get a little bit less, that's totally normal. And so, you know, addressing those thoughts, kind of deconstructing them, seeing how much validity there is to them is the first step. Now, along those lines, it's really important to understand how sleep works. Because for these folks who have trouble sleeping and who have uh, developed a, sort of a panic response around it, oftentimes what you'll see is they'll start spending more and more time in bed, hoping that they're going to get more sleep and trying to get more sleep. And so they'll go to bed like two, three hours earlier than they normally would, or they'll stay in bed until uh, the late hours in the morning as late as they can, um, hoping that they're just going to get a few hours here and there. But that actually becomes counterproductive. Because as I mentioned, it then trains your brain to be awake in the bed. So 
another technique we use in CBTI is called sleep restriction, where we actually restrict the amount of time in bed closer to the amount of time you're actually sleeping to help increase what we call sleep efficiency, which is basically the proportion of time you're asleep while you're in bed. So you're going to use the cognitive behavioral protocol for inducing sleep, and you're going to work maybe a little bit with melatonin, but definitely with light. And you mentioned about this breaking this cycle of kind of panic inducing thoughts that lead to this heightened neurologic state. A lot of talk about the hyperarousal and the amygdala and and um, how common is it for you that when you begin working with people, they're already taking these over-the-counter or prescription sleep aids and they're still not sleeping? It is incredibly common. And this is what I see a lot of in my practice is that people will come to me for sleep issues, but they also want help getting off of these sleeping pills. And you know, so I'll see people who are on prescription sleeping pills, things like Ambien or maybe even benzodiazepines like clonopin or Ativan that they take every night for sleep, or they may be taking over-the-counter sleeping pills, things like Tylenol PM or Benadryl-based products. It's really interesting because they'll come with the complaint that they can't sleep, yet they're stuck on these pills. And what we do know is that you know sleeping pills are meant to be used short-term only. They're not meant to be used for more than two weeks. Um, they were never designed for long-term use. And they should be used at the lowest doses uh, possible for the shortest period of time required. So usually just for acute situational stressors. Maybe if someone is just going through a tough time, you know, they're going through a loss of a job or a divorce or something like that, they may need a little bit of support with sleep from a sleeping pill. But what happens long-term is that these pills can actually start to cause um, what we call tolerance. So um, it just kind of stops working um, and then you need higher doses to get an effect from it. They can also cause rebound insomnia. So when you try to stop the pill, then the insomnia actually gets worse. And what people often attribute this to is, is just saying, well, I can't sleep without the pill, thinking that they need the pill in order to sleep. But what's actually happening is that it's rebound insomnia. And so tapering off slowly while implementing some of these other strategies that I mentioned, will help the person be able to restore their sleep naturally and actually sleep better without medication. Well, and that's the goal. You know, the, uh, the number of people that en end up walking into my office who are already on two, three, or five medications. And what I say to them is, well, that's good if the med medications are helping you, but if they're helping you so much, why do you need therapy? And, and what comes out is the medications maybe worked for a little bit early on in taking them, and now they're not working. And then maybe they've increased the dose two or three times and now it's not working again. So hopefully um, you're going to branch out and do more than just sleep. You're going to have a program for this, that, and the other thing. So let's come back to your sleep program. We've got getting to sleep a little earlier gradually, making sure that I wake up, watching the light, watching the obsessive thoughts, and focusing more on relaxation as a goal rather than focusing on I have to sleep. What else is in this program? What, what other kinds of factors do you direct people to look at or work with? Another thing that I recommend people look at is uh, basically an underlying cause or underlying causes for sleep issues. Because this is often forgotten or missed as well. You know, all of these things that I just mentioned, the circadian rhythm, sleep drive, and hyperarousal, it's important to address those three things. But if there's something that's contributing to the underlying sleep issue, just focusing on those three, three things isn't going to be enough. Examples of underlying causes would be things like obstructive sleep apnea. Now, this is commonly seen in the um, psychotherapist's office or the psychiatrist's office because about 20% of people with depression have obstructive sleep apnea. So it's really important um, if you're a, a healthcare provider in the mental health space that you are screening your patients for this or, or you, um, you know, talk, have them talk to their doctor about it. So signs of obstructive sleep apnea would be things like snoring, waking up gasping or choking at night. Your partner might notice that sometimes you stop breathing at night or you wake up with a little choke or a little snort. Sometimes waking up with a dry mouth or a headache feeling excessively sleepy during the day or tired or feeling unrefreshed in the morning, and then also having trouble falling asleep and maintaining sleep 
can be signs of sleep apnea. Well, I've had a lot of people who've had their experiences that they sleep a lot and yet they're always tired. And that's one of the things I tell them, you should check this out. Unfortunately, for a lot of people, they get prescribed a CPAP machine and they've got all kinds of problems with it. I can't have that thing on my face. It's just too noisy or whatever. So what do you prescribe for people or how do you help people who might have obstructive sleep apnea if they can't really tolerate the CPAP machines? It's a really common problem because, I mean, who wants to sleep with a mask on their face, right, and being hooked up to a machine? Now, many people do find CPAP to be life-changing, right? So when you get the right mask, you get the right pressure, you get the right settings, the right humidity, and all of that stuff, it, it's like day and night, <laughs> you know, no pun intended. But, uh, you know, they can really be life-changing for people. So what I recommend to people is that if you have a CPAP machine and you're not comfortable with it, don't be afraid to go talk to your doctor about trying different masks. You can go into the clinic, you can do mask fittings, you can find the right configuration, talk to them about your settings. There's different ways you can play around with the settings that that has to be prescribed by your doctor, but they can make adjustments to that to make it as comfortable as possible for you. Finding the right mask is kind of like finding um, a well-fitting pair of shoes you know, like it might feel comfortable in the store, but then when you start wearing them outside and walking them around, you might realize, oh, they're pinching in the heel or my, my toes butting up against the front or whatever. You may have not noticed that when you were in the store. So finding a mask is like that. It might feel okay, you know, during that one overnight sleep study or whatnot. But when you start using it at home, you might realize it's, it's not quite the right fit. So don't be afraid to uh, troubleshoot that. But there are other ways to address sleep apnea beyond CPAP. Um, there are things called oral appliances or dental devices, which are calibrated by a dentist that gently pull the jaw forward so that it opens up the airway space. Um, and that can help with sleep apnea. So that's something to consider as well. Sometimes if it's weight related, working on a weight loss plan um, while you're using a CPAP machine or an or oral appliance could be a long-term solution as well. And then if there are very significant obstructions in the airway, sometimes those can be treated surgically. Yeah, I know a number of people who have had the weight reduction and that's the solution for them. And they, they learn they have to keep their weight below a certain level or that the extra weight is enough to bring on that disruptive snoring pattern or the sleep apnea. And I've had several people recently who've had good, good results with the dental appliance and several people who haven't. So it's this, you know, you just have to keep working with something until you find something that'll work for you. A couple people, they went to a dentist who specializes in this. They got measured, they get, and they bring the thing home and they're using it and it just, it's too painful for whatever reason. And whether it's a mental issue or there's an actual physical pain and they've gone back for several fittings and it doesn't work. So it's, it's good to hear you say there's these other options and that you can go back and retry the multiple attempts at a mask and adjusting settings with your prescribing doctor for the CPAP machine. What level of psychological involvement, if any, do you find with people who are having sleep problems? In my practice, of course, I'm a psychiatrist. So I see people who have anxiety and depression, um, and other psychiatric conditions as well. And there is a bi-directional relationship between mood disorders and sleep disorders. We know that when people have anxiety and depression, they're at a higher risk of having sleep disorders. There are many different sleep disorders. We're talking a lot about insomnia today, but there are other sleep disorders as well, like hypersomnia is another condition we see with depression. But when we're looking at insomnia specifically, um, we see that there's a high prevalence of insomnia in patients who have anxiety and depression, but also vice versa. When people have insomnia, even if they don't have underlying anxiety or depression, they're more likely to develop anxiety or depression down the line if the sleep issue is left untreated. And I'll just mention that um, people who have insomnia are more than twice as likely to develop an anxiety disorder. You said there's that bi-directional relationship, and I've had a number of people who had a trauma-based anxiety issue, and it was devastating to their sleep and had been for either months or years. And the only solution was to identify and then help them resolve the effects of a past trauma. And 
then lo and behold, the natural system takes over and it's okay to sleep again. You know, there was uh, one person who just had this absolute belief that if they fell asleep, they weren't going to wake up. And it came out of, you know, seemingly out of nowhere after years of being a, a relatively good sleeper. And until they uncovered what was the root of that false belief that was feeding this terror, there was no solution in, in all of the sleep aids and all of the drugs that was going to get them past that. They had to identify the trauma and then be willing to work on resolving the effects of that trauma. That's such an important point because you need to experience a sense of safety in order to fall asleep, right? So our bodies have evolved to have this hyperarousal response that we've been speaking about. It's a safety mechanism. So, you know, way back when, when we were living out in the forest or whatnot, our bodies evolved to respond to sounds or changes in the environment um, and to respond to external threats or potential threats by waking up at night. That's, that's what kept us safe. And so if there was any sort of perceived stressor, that would keep us up all night. That's how the brain has evolved. Now, even if there isn't an, an immediate external threat or stressor, our brain still follows that pattern of staying awake when you don't experience a sense of safety or if you, if you experience your environment is unsafe. And so that's how trauma feeds into this you know, perpetuating sort of cycle of insomnia. Yeah, and it's, it can be debilitating. So, you know, I remember working with one woman who the, 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 pa the pattern began when she had read about sudden infant death syndrome. And then within a few weeks of hearing about that and then having her own child, she walked in and found her baby, you know, blue from oxygen depletion and went into a panic. Well, fortunately, her baby survived and everything worked out. But after that, she developed the pattern of if the baby was sleeping, she had to be awake. Mm -hmm. And then if the baby was awake and somebody else was with the baby, then she could sleep. And that was, you know, so here's the kid, three, four, five years old, and we're past the point where sudden infant death syndrome might be an issue. And she still has the disruption in her sleep problem. So until she got at the root of that and did some trauma work around it, she wasn't able to sleep. Oh, that is such a terrifying thing. I, I mean, I can't imagine how scary that must have been for her. And you're exactly right is that, you know, you have to get to the root cause of the sleep issue, whether it's trauma or some other condition. And that's why these sleeping pills don't work long term, because they don't get to the root cause. They're just sedating without providing any long term relief or providing any long term solution. And that's also why when people stop these pills, the sleeping issues come back because you haven't addressed the root cause in the first place. Well, that and as you say, the rebound, because this the brain is trying to work to reach homeostasis. And when you pull that very strong active substance out, your brain's got to compensate in some way. And so, as you mentioned before, that rebound effect can mean you might have to go off of it very, very slowly. And then you've got to find out what the original cause of the disruption was. That's exactly right. And when I'm helping people taper off of these sleeping pills, sometimes we'll take like a year to taper off. There's no rush, especially if people have been taking them for a long time. So I'll have patients come to me who have been taking, for example, something like clonazepam or clonopin for uh, 10 years. And they've also developed this kind of belief that they need it to function, they need it to sleep. So part of the process of tapering is kind of unraveling and untangling those thoughts associated with the medication. But um, I'll have patients take, you know, six to 12 months, sometimes even a little bit longer to taper off. We'll do it very, very slowly, very gradually, almost to the point where they don't even notice it while we're implementing all of these other strategies. And inevitably what people tell me is that after they've tapered off and they've been off for a few weeks or a few months is that they have more energy. They actually feel less anxious. They're sleeping better. They feel like they've gotten their lives back. They're functioning better. This is what I, I hear almost every single time after tapering someone off these types of medications. Yeah, it's, it's very rewarding when you can hear that from somebody. I just had the thought in, in what little time we have left here to, to start talking about um, 
all of a sudden I was just thinking about the gut biome and whether or not how powerful that is to interact with the hormone system and the endocrine system, et cetera. So do you do any work with that? I know as an integrative psychiatrist, it's all open possibility, but do you find a lot of connection with the gut biome and the hormone cycle with sleep disruption? This area I find so fascinating and there's emerging research coming out on the link between the gut microbiome and sleep and the circadian rhythm. We know that when people have sleep apnea, for example, they, they show signs of dysbiosis or alterations in the gut microbiome, maybe not dysbiosis per se, but we, we know that there's a difference in the composition of their gut microbiome. So one thing I, I talk to all of my patients about whether or not they have sleep issues is gut health and nutrition. And with speak, uh, sleep specifically, it's shown that diets that are high in fat and high in sugar are associated with more awakenings at night um, and less restorative sleep versus diets that are high in fiber, which of course are good for the gut microbiome. High fiber diets are shown to uh, improve sleep duration, sleep quality, and also help to restore that slow wave deep sleep stage that's really important for um, restoration and brain health. So yeah, there is a link between the two. And actually, um, it's interesting, so I was looking up some of the research just yesterday uh, for another project that I'm doing um, on the gut microbiome and sleep. And it's, there was a study recently that showed that increased diversity in the microbiome is associated with increased sleep efficiency and total sleep time. Now, this is an early sort of like uh, area of research. So we need a lot more studies to kind of fully understand the implications of, of this, but it's, it's really interesting. And one of the reasons they think that uh, this is the case is because the microbiome, the bacteria in the gut produce byproducts, um, including short chain fatty acids. And these byproducts help to reduce inflammation, but they also influence the clock genes, so circadian rhythm genes that we talked about earlier. So there is an interaction between uh, the gut microbiome composition and the, in our internal body clock. So yeah, I think that's really fascinating. And it's also been shown that people who have dysbiosis are more likely to exhibit signs of sleep fragmentation and short sleep patterns. And so what is dysbiosis? So dysbiosis is essentially, uh, you can think of it as like an overgrowth of um, unhealthy bacteria in the gut. So we have, when you think about the microbiome, you wanna think about a very lush rainforest where you've got lots of diversity. There's different species and you know, in a rainforest, you've got different plants and different trees and different animals. So you wanna think of your gut microbiome in that way. You don't want a Saharan desert where it's kind of just very homogenous. So when there's dysbiosis, there's too much of, of usually one or two strains that kind of take over and it reduces that microbial diversity. And that's shown to have uh, multiple downstream effects on sleep, but other um, health related conditions. And the, the standard way to address a dysbiosis is what? How do you, do you work with prebiotics and probiotics? Do you just vary the diet? What decrease sugar? What I usually go back to basics and start with diet. A nutritional assessment is part of my kind of standard practice with my patients, whether or not they have sleep issues or maybe they're coming to me for anxiety or depression. So really kind of getting a good sense of what the person is eating, incorporating more fruits and vegetables. One simple way to increase the diversity of your microbiome is to increase the diversity of the plants that you're consuming. So simply eating more fruits and vegetables, different kinds, fruits and vegetables of different colors, um, making sure there's a wide variety in your diet across the week is really important. So, and also increasing your intake of fiber and healthy fats. So sources of fiber would include these uh, fruits and vegetables that I just mentioned, but also whole grains. So things like millet or oats or barley, quinoa, brown rice, things like that. And then increasing your intake of healthy fats is important as well. So this food sources of that would be things like nuts and seeds, walnuts, pumpkin seeds, almonds, um, avocados are also a great source of healthy fat. So really kind of focusing back in on 
you know, a diverse diet. A lot of my patients will focus in on just trying to eat everything in one day, and then it becomes overwhelming, right? And then they kind of bounce back. So what I tell people is don't worry about getting every single item in, of, you know, of this list that I just mentioned into your diet every single day. Just think about it over the course of a week. You know, when do you want to incorporate these fruits and vegetables and these healthy fats and, and have fun with it and play with it? It should feel nourishing and not stressful. Excellent. Well, so if, if somebody wants to find out more about this or get access to you and your four-week program, how can they do that? I have a YouTube channel that I recommend to uh, everyone if you want to learn more about this. I share a lot of information about gut health and diet, nutrition, sleep, and mental health on there. And my YouTube channel can be found under Intra Balance, I-N-T-R-A Balance. My four-week program is currently closed for registration, but I will be opening it up again later this year. And I have some other smaller programs in the works for people who maybe aren't ready to commit to four full weeks. I've got some smaller offerings in the pipeline. Excellent. Well, I, I greatly appreciate your willingness to come back and share with us about this progress. And I look forward to hearing more as you move forward and other programs you might develop. Thank you Thank very much. You're, you're, you're very welcome and deserving. And thank you so much for sharing with us. And I'll, I'll be in touch as I uh, stay plugged into your YouTube channel and see what you develop. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right. Take care. Dr. Nishi Bhopal is triple board certified in psychiatry, sleep medicine, and integrative holistic medicine. She graduated from the University College Cork School of Medicine, completed her psychiatric residency at Henry Ford Health System, and a fellowship in sleep medicine at Harvard Medical School. She also received training through the Maharishi Ayurveda Association of America and the Integrative Psychiatry Institute. Having grown up in an Indian family in Canada and lived in several different countries, Dr. Bhopal understands what it means to be multicultural and is attuned to the unique challenges faced by immigrants and expats. She's also a meditator and brings her experiences with yoga and meditation into clinical practice, blending the best of ancient wisdom and modern medicine. Dr. Bhopal is the founder of Intrabalance Integrative Psychiatry and Sleep in San Francisco and is a founding member of the Same Here Psych Alliance, a global initiative to reduce the stigma around mental health. Her passion is making mental wellness and the science of sleep easy to understand and accessible to all. Her website is intrabalance.com, I-N-T-R-A-B-A-L-A-N-C-E. You've been listening to the On Your Mind podcast, offered by Journey's Dream, where we support people through mental health challenges to a place of true and lasting well-being. If you love our show, we invite you to visit onyourmindpodcast.org to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our helpful resources. Thank you for listening. 